Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. I've always found as a newer player, it was easy to overlook Siege. It's not as flashy as some of the other unit types. They're kind of slow and expensive, pretty weak to melee units, and aren't quite as intuitive to figure out how to use. At the same time, they're definitely not units you want to avoid altogether. In this video, I'd like to take a look at what roles I like to use each of the different Siege units for, and hopefully give you some ideas to try in your own games. If you're already a pretty experienced player, I imagine a lot of these will just reaffirm some of the things that you're already doing. Let's check it out. To start things off, let's take a look at the battering ram. When you think siege, you might think anti-building, and the ram definitely fits that role. On paper, it has just two attack, but hidden behind that is a massive attack bonus against buildings. In addition to that, its high pierce armor makes it unique in Castle Age at least for its ability to take out defensive buildings and town centers, which can only do one damage per arrow to them. The flip side is that they take three extra damage from villagers and other melee units. That's why you'll sometimes see players successfully fighting them off with villagers, and they seem to go down faster than their high HP would suggest, if not properly defended from cavalry or infantry. Rams can still perform a similar anti-building role in Imperial Age, though in that case they'll have to compete with the trebuchet, which demolishes buildings at a similar rate, but from the safety of being 300 meters away. The Rams' high pierce armor also means they take one damage from bombard towers, which kind of doesn't make sense when you think about it, but is a useful fact to keep in mind. That makes them a great counter unit to send in first against mass towers to draw a lot of their fire, allowing other units to be sent in afterward. Bombard cannons, on the other hand, do melee damage, so they end up doing 63 damage per shot to rams, making them the much larger threat. Now trebuchets are an interesting one, because their pierce damage attack is similar to the ram's pierce armor, with both around 200. For a regular battering ram, that equates to 11 damage per shot, but for the siege ram, that's down to just 6. In addition to holding up well against defensive buildings, that high pierce armor also gives them a somewhat less obvious role as a counter to archers. In fact, I'd argue they're the best counter to mass longbowmen. That's not so much because they actually fight them head to head, but because archers prioritize attacking the closest enemy unit, meaning any of your own ranged units behind the rams are not going to be hit without your opponent physically targeting them individually. Another more obscure role that rams can sometimes play that might be handy in a pinch is that they have 40 bonus damage against other siege units, letting rams take out many of them in just a few hits. That makes it an interesting counter against enemy trebuchets in a pinch, for example, again assuming there aren't enemy melee units nearby. Garrisoning units into the ram also speeds it up and slightly increases its attack by 10 damage per garrisoned unit, meaning the potential is there to increase their attack by about a third. The garrison process is a bit time consuming to organize, so it's not something that most players online seem to consider being worth the effort. On occasion, it can help units or villagers get past a lot of arrow fire, and with a slow melee unit like the Teutonic Knight that is weak against archers, you can make the argument there's some nice synergy there. It's also pretty cheap to upgrade to Capped Ram, which gets an extra garrison slot, a greater area of splash damage around it, and an even higher attack bonus against buildings. That's quite a bit of value for just 300 food. The Siege Ram upgrade, on the other hand, is quite a bit more expensive at 1000 food, with again more damage output, a greater damage area, and faster movement. Each upgrade, of course, also comes with an increase to their defensive stats, like HP and Pierce Armor. So overall, I characterize Rams as a tanky anti-building specialist unit, with a useful role to play against archers and taking out the occasional unprotected trebuchet. The next unit is my favorite type of siege, and that's the Manganel and Onager line. They do melee damage, but attack from 7 or more range, while featuring a large area of effect. Unlike the Battering Ram, which is specialized in dealing with buildings, the Manganel is primarily used against groups of enemy units. They're a common counter to archers, starting in the mid-game, 
though at a high enough level of play and with low enough lag, that becomes less and less true. In those situations, the effectiveness comes down to the skill gap between the archer player's dodging and the mangonel player's ability to predict the archer's movements with the attack ground feature. Not only do both units have similar range, but the mangonel also features some decent pierce armor. So in a game between average players, the mangonels are usually going to trade effectively. In the Castle Age, military numbers are often low enough as well that a nice mangonel shot or two can take out a good chunk of a player's army and dramatically shift momentum. In the late game, onagers still have a useful role against large groups of enemies, but like mangonels, have an easily exploited weakness of minimum range. That means they need to be combined with melee units to prevent cavalry from getting too close. Unlike some other siege units, friendly fire can also be an issue, which is part of why they combine so well with cheap throwaway units like pikes or halberdiers. It's a simple and common pairing that allows both units to cover each other's weaknesses. In addition to that role, they're actually not terrible against buildings either. They have a bit of bonus damage against them, though between their fire rate and lower damage, they end up doing only about half the damage per second of the ram over time. On the other hand, they outrange the town center by one tile, letting you put pressure on your opponent with less risk of having your siege fought off by villagers. And speaking of villagers, they're also one of the most effective ways to stop villagers from pushing through buildings like castles or towers, given their great damage and area of attack. Looking quickly at their upgrades, the Onager upgrade is a bit unique by giving you the ability to easily cut trees in the modern expansions. A couple of other units can do this, but certainly not at the same rate. That's useful on forested maps, of course, as you can show up a long way from where your opponent is expecting you. You also get an increase to their range, HP, attack, and pierce armor, along with a slightly larger area of damage. Considering how many ways they're improved, and how expensive mangonels are to begin with at 160 wood and 135 gold, it's a fairly common upgrade to see people pick up in Imperial Age. It's also available for every civilization except Huns and Turks, further contributing to how common they are to see. The Siege Onager, on the other hand, is a lot more restrictive and expensive to upgrade, and therefore more rare. Less than a third of civilizations have access to it, and those that do tend to have other siege bonuses like faster speed, attack rate, and range, etc. For their large cost, you get 50% more damage than the Onager, a bit more HP and armor, and they get another increase to their area of attack, making them even harder to dodge. In classic Age of Conquerors, this is the upgrade you need to cut trees, making civilizations that have access to it important on forested maps. Again, assuming it's properly protected from cavalry, the Siege Onager is arguably the greatest weapon of mass destruction that you can find in the game. Next up, let's take a look at the Scorpion. They make for an interesting contrast with mangonels because they fire in a straight line to damage multiple units rather than in a circular area. The actual attack works by dealing full damage to the unit they target and half damage to any other enemy units that they happen to hit. It's not uncommon at all to see people use staggered formations against them to try to reduce some of that extra damage. They also don't have friendly fire and are significantly cheaper, giving them a few quick points over the mangonel. Now unlike the two siege units we've seen so far though, scorpions don't perform very well against buildings, and instead fill a purely anti-unit role. They're generally considered to be a counter to infantry and archers, and any other slow moving or low HP units, though enough of them can even do well against cavalry, especially in closed spaces. It really comes down to how many you have, and how well you're using the terrain to squeeze the enemy into a line. As well, more than any other siege unit, getting scorpion numbers up to a critical mass is incredibly important, as rather than diminishing returns, increasing their numbers only makes them all work better. A single scorpion isn't very scary, and their cheaper price reflects that, but a group of 20 or 30 in a choke point can make quick work of any passing army. Part of the reason for that is they have a minimum range of 3 tiles, and an unfortunate habit of targeting the closest unit to them. So in practice, they work best when set on stand ground. Taking a look at their upgrade, the Heavy Scorpion comes at a steep price, especially considering how cheap the individual units are, but it's paired with a sizable increase to their attack and HP. Considering how many units you normally use at once, and how critical it is to stop enemies before they close the distance, the extra 4 attack makes the upgrade worth considering. Online, they're definitely the least used siege unit that we've seen so far, which I think is for two main reasons. 
First of all, you need a large number of them to provide a proper threat to infantry and cavalry, which leaves you vulnerable while you're getting those numbers up. Second, and I think more important, is their slow speed and low HP make them very hard countered by Onagers and Mangonels. That's not to say Scorpions are always a bad idea, but a problem that constantly plagues them is that even when used correctly, a lucky Onager shot can wipe out half your army. The next siege units I'd like to discuss as a pair, since I feel they have very similar roles as long range artillery, and that's the Bombard Cannon and Trebuchet. These are the two most expensive units in the game, though in the right situation they can definitely be worth it. Both outrange most civilization's castles and force your opponent to bring their army to you, unless they want their buildings to be slowly chipped away. That being said, I wouldn't call the units completely interchangeable. To look at the Bombard Cannon first, it has anywhere between 12 and 15 range, depending on the civilization and upgrades, which they combine with high attack, accuracy, a reasonable attack rate, lots of bonus damage against buildings, and even splash damage if they fire into a group of units. The Trebuchet, in contrast, has a bit more range, even higher attack, though with a lower attack rate and lower accuracy. They also require a bit of time to set up and take down. For me, the Bombard Cannon's big selling feature is their extra mobility, making them an effective counter to lots of dangerous siege units like the Trebuchet, Onager, and Scorpion. That's why in addition to being anti-building artillery, I sometimes consider them to be a part-time defensive counter unit, at least much more so than the Trebuchet. The main two drawbacks of the Bombard Cannon, in my opinion, are first that it's a bit harder to get access to than the Trebuchet both because it requires chemistry to be researched first, as well as the fact it's simply not available for every civilization. Another drawback is they have significantly less pierce armor, making them a lot more squishy, especially around archers. The trebuchet, in contrast, is more specialized for cracking defenses, thanks to higher damage and range. It's also available for every civilization, assuming you have a castle, making it easy to get out as soon as you hit Imperial. A couple of other nice things about the trebuchet are that it can destroy trees, as well as the fact that it doesn't deal friendly fire, meaning unlike the Bombard Cannon, you can indiscriminately fire it into a blob of your own units without hesitation. At the end of the day, both units see a lot of play at every skill level, and one or both will inevitably make an appearance at some point in any game that extends into the Imperial Age. For me, the trebuchet is the better building killer and the more durable unit that I'll lean toward if I'm really stretched for gold, whereas the Bombard Cannon is the more versatile unit I lean more on when my opponent is using a lot of siege. So those are all of the siege units. Wait, what's that siege tower? You want me to talk about you too? I suppose before I wrap things up, we should look at the newest addition to the siege family. Now I've been a little hard on the siege tower for not being very good but let's try to give it a fair shake. It's available in the modern expansions and is unique for being the only siege unit that can't attack at all. Instead, it can garrison up to 10 units and ungarrison them across walls. It's pretty easy to see how that would be a useful trick in arena or really any map as long as the walls you're jumping are only one tile thick. It does have to be pointed out though that the petard can also kickstart a sneak attack in a similar way. If you happen to have a castle, they're a slightly cheaper option and much less finicky to use. In addition to some sneaky wall hopping shenanigans, siege towers can also be used just as a fast way to move units around the map and past enemy archers or defenses. That in itself might sound similar to the ram, but the advantage is that it does the same thing a lot faster and with better garrison space. On the other hand, it doesn't provide the threat to buildings that the battering ram normally does and costs significantly more. It's not so much that the siege tower is useless, but that its cost and lack of attack capacity restrict it to a single use, moving other units from point A to B. Even while doing that specific function, it's easily foiled though by simply having double layered walls or two separate walls. At this point, I think the general perception is that it's more of a novelty unit than one that really has a lot more to explore. But if you don't think that's fair, feel free to let me know. In fact, if you have some of your own tips on any of the siege units listed, you're more than welcome to share those. It's a diverse group with strengths and situations in which they excel, many of which can also play multiple roles. 
Even in the Imperial Age, the Trebuchet and Bombard Cannon still don't completely replace the Ram, which still does better than either when it comes to actually cleaning up an opponent's base, given their higher mobility, cheaper cost, and quick creation speed. You can start to see it's not really about picking a favorite siege unit and just sticking to that one, but more about figuring out how each plays a unique role, even if there is a bit of overlap. That's all for this one though. I hope you picked up a new little idea or inspiration to try using Siege in a slightly different way. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.